This morning, as you find your place in Psalm 51, many of you probably know this passage well. It's a psalm of confession and repentance from a man after God's own heart who had messed up in a really bad way. He had sinned against God. He had sinned against the people. He had sinned against everyone by committing adultery with Bathsheba, and then he covered his sin up by having her husband murdered. And this was a man after God's own heart. I was pricked again as I looked at this passage as we started off the new year. And we're still in January and many of us are getting started with 2023. And maybe you thought about New Year's resolutions and some things that you wanted to change in your life this year. In fact, I was reminded the other day, someone said we get 1% better or 1% worse every day. And then that compounds over time. And so many of you may have had some New Year's resolutions where you're going in a certain direction. Maybe it's losing weight, maybe it's getting out of debt, maybe it's uh, going on a special trip, maybe it's reading more. But I want to suggest this to you. As I contemplated the new year, I realized afresh and anew that the greatest thing that I could be shooting for this year, other than God getting glory through my life, is this. I needed to make sure that I was restoring my intimacy with God and continuing to restore that intimacy. You see, the greatest thing God wants in your life and mine this morning is that we are intimate. You know, I've been reminded, once you're saved, you can't lose your salvation, but you sure can lose the joy of it. And Christ is our joy. He not only saved us from sin, but he saved us to himself. He saved us for relationship. We were made for him. And in Psalm 51, I see a man after God's own heart that though he was saved, he had lost the joy of the salvation he had been given. And I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know where you're struggling. I don't know what you may be distracted with. For many of us, it's not some egregious gross sin. For some of us, it's we've gotten so busy and working in the name of Jesus that we've grown distant and now are not intimate with Jesus. And this morning, I want to challenge you with restoring intimacy with the one who has given his all to claim you back as his own. And this morning, it's not a fancy sermon. I don't even have three points. I've defied everything I learned across the street on hermeneutics. In fact, if you try to take notes this morning, you may have a hard time. What I'm going to do this morning is I'm just going to walk through the verses and let the Holy Spirit take the word of God and penetrate our hearts. How's that? And then if you want a fancy outline, come back tonight. Before I read the passage, I was reminded uh, a few weeks ago, right as the new year started, several years ago, about three years ago, my family was vacationing down at Jekyll Island, Georgia. Anybody here have been to Jekyll Island? It is wonderful. Do y'all do like it as much as I do? It is wonderful. And it's not a very populated beach. It's a gorgeous place. It's a state park there in Georgia. It's my wife's favorite place to go. And we're not much of beach people. Uh, I used to have red hair. Back when I had Kivet in youth group, like years ago, my hair was completely red. Every time I see Kivet, he reminds me that it's not red anymore. And uh, I, because I used to have red hair, whenever I'm out into the sun, it's either red, white, or peeling. I mean, there is no such thing as a tan in my life. For those of you who are tan, I am so jealous of you. And since it's wrong to be jealous, I try not to think about it. But I'm either red, white, or peeling, so we're not much into the beach. And when we go out to the beach, we either go out early in the morning or late in the evening when the sun isn't frying all the redheaded people in my family. The, the other reason I don't like the beach is years ago, I was way out in the water with some, with some friends, and we were having fun, and all of a sudden, something really big bumped into my leg. And I thought to myself, I have no idea what that was. And it can see me, but I can't see it. I don't like this. I don't like the water. I, I really don't. The, the idea of a shark taking off with my leg is quite incredible. So I'm not much into the beach. And so we go out early in the morning. We go out in the evening. Uh, I'm not, when I'm on vacation, I'm not into being around a whole lot of people, just kind of quiet. And sure enough, we're there at Jekyll Island. And we walked out one evening. And literally, as far as you could see that way, and as far as you could see that way on the beach, there might have been five or six people that way, five or six people that way. Hardly no one was out there. And we were just playing around in the water. We weren't far at all because we don't get far in the water. I mean, maybe right up to here. And Lexi, the redheaded girl that uh, was singing up here, this is, that's my 17-year-old daughter. She was sitting there swimming, and we were just kind of splashing around. And next thing I know, though she's facing me, she's being pulled out into the ocean. And I looked at her and I said, Lexi, what are you doing? She goes, I don't know. She goes, Dad, I keep trying to swim, but I, I can't get to you. And she kept being pulled out. 
I said, come back. She goes, I can't. Now, many of you are sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, that's a riptide. Well, I had heard about riptides, but I was no expert in riptides. In fact, I found out later that night, I went home and watched a YouTube video on riptides, and I found that if you're going to get out of a riptide, the worst thing you can do is try to swim straight on back to shore because the riptide keeps pulling you out, and no matter how hard you swim, you're going to exasperate yourself, you're going to lose your strength, you're going to drown. And over 100 people a year die from a riptide. Well, I didn't know all that at that moment. Now, they tell you that to get out of a riptide, there's two ways to do it. You don't swim towards the shore, you swim parallel. You go to the right or left and swim out of the riptide and come around. Well, I didn't know that. The second way you get out of riptide is to let it take you all the way out in the ocean where the sharks are, and if you survive the sharks, you can then swim around the riptide. I didn't know that either. So I take off after her. I leave Valerie and my other daughter, Brianna, here, who's... Uh, 12 years old. I leave them up on the beach. Our, my sons weren't with us, and so it was just us. And I took off after Lexi. Well, by the time I got to her, we were in the thick of this riptide. The waves were crashing into us, and I had one arm on her, and I was holding her up, and she was starting to panic, and I was starting to panic, and we would go under, and we'd come back up for air, and this went on for what seemed like an eternity. After the 10th or 12th time of going under the waves and coming back up, and no matter how hard I would swim, I couldn't get anywhere. I thought, I can't get out of this. And there was no way I wanted to let my girl go, but I realized, too, in a few moments, I'm not going to even be able to keep myself up. And I never will forget that feeling when I looked down at the ocean one time after I came up, and I saw kind of the abyss under the water, and I thought, in just a few moments, I'm going to wear completely out, and I'm going under, and this is the way I'm going to meet Jesus. We went under the water a few more times. I come back up, and about that time, in a distance, I saw a man out in the water who had not been there because there was hardly no one on the beach, and he was with his son. So we went under the water. We came back up. We're waterlogged. I'm coughing. We're half drowned. And I put on the best preacher voice I knew how, and I said, help! And he didn't hear me. We went under. I came up again, help! He didn't hear me. We went under. Finally, on the third time, I said, help! And he heard me, and he started swimming toward me. By the time he got to me, we were at our wit's end. And he had this six-foot-long surfboard. It is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen in my entire life. And he was just as calm as he could be. He came right into that riptide. I mean, in his world, you wouldn't even know a riptide was going on. He just so calm, he came in. He said, now listen, y'all calm down, take a deep breath. He said, wrap your body around my surfboard. He said, be careful, it's okay. The waves are gonna keep hitting you. I got you, but I'm gonna get you out of here. We wrapped ourselves around that surfboard. Next thing I know, I'm up on the beach. I can barely stand up. I'm so weak. I'm coughing up water. Lexi's coughing up water. She's crying. I'm exasperated. Finally, I got enough water out of my lungs. I looked over at my daughter and I said, do you realize we should be dead? She goes, I know. And all this is going on. Valerie's run up. Brianna's run up. I mean, it's just crazy. And I'm trying to get my bearings. And all of a sudden, I stood up, to, stood up on my two feet, barely got there, and looked at this man and I said, where did you come from? I said, when we came out on the beach, there was nobody near us. He goes, well, it's interesting. He said, I saw your family out in the water. And he said, my wife and I just decided to come over here and sit down. He goes, I'm a professional surfer. He said, you're the third person I've saved out of a riptide. I'm like, wow, and you just happen to show up at this time of the day. Man, I thanked him. I, at that moment, I would have given that guy everything I had. I thanked him. I, I mean, like, how do you thank somebody? You just saved my life, like they just sang about. You just saved my life and my daughter's life. He acted like it was nothing. He and his wife went on. We went back in the house. I had, truly, I think I had PTSD for several days. I didn't even want to see the water ever again. That was three years ago. And something happened a few weeks ago. We're sitting at, at the dining room table. And my 12-year-old, out of nowhere, we're eating Chipotle. We're just having a good time eating Chipotle. We weren't talking about dying from riptides. We weren't talking about the ocean. I don't even know what we were talking about. And out of nowhere, my 12-year-old looks up at me, and she goes, hey, Dad, she goes, you remember a few years ago when you and Lexi about died in that riptide? I said, yep, thanks for bringing that back up. 
She said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. She said, do you remember what the guy looked like who saved you? And I thought about it. I thought, no. She said, Dad, if he was to talk, would you remember his voice? No. And then she just went on and started eating her Chipotle again and act like nothing happened. Your kids ever do that to you? They usually do it at 11 o'clock at night when you're ready to go to bed. They ask you the most profound things. She kept talking, and all of a sudden, God just gripped my heart. And I thought to myself, if that guy who saved my life and my daughter's life were to walk in the back of Salem Baptist Church this morning and come into the room, I wouldn't know it was him. I forgot what he looked like. I wouldn't recognize his voice. But three years ago, I would have given that guy everything. And then it's like God pricked my heart and said, I wonder if that's sometimes what salvation is like. Because 38 years ago, 45 minutes away in Denton, North Carolina, at the same church that your pastor grew up at, we grew up together. In a Sunday school room at the age of five, Jesus Christ saved my soul. But there have been times over the past 38 years that I went to Bible college and seminary and pastored, there have been times that I have forgot what he looks like. Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. There's been times I forgot his voice, his still small voice and the quiet promptings of the Holy Spirit. There have been times I've got so busy working for him and in his name that I forgot about him. And this morning I wonder if you're in a place well, you're not as intimate as you used to be. I was challenged by a 90-some-year-old man not too long ago. He said, Mark, he said, do you remember those times in your Christian life where all you wanted was to please God? There wasn't all the headaches of life, all the distractions, all the burdens of ministry, church politics, church bureaucracy, this person fussing, this person fighting, this person complaining, this need. You remember the day where there wasn't all that and it was just you and Jesus? And how sweet that was. But like Martha, you got all encumbered and distracted and worried and stressed and burnt out. And though you were still saved, you had lost the joy of your salvation. That's where David finds himself this morning. Would you look with me? Psalm 51. I'm going to read it, stop every few moments, make a few comments, and then bring it to a head this morning. Nothing fancy. We're just going to let the Word of God speak to us. Psalm 51, verse 1, David cries out, almost two years after he had sinned with Bathsheba, he had walked around in unrepentance. Nathan the prophet confronted him. David, you're the man. And David, because he was a man after God's own heart, he repented, and this is his prayer of repentance. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. I want you to think about that for a moment. God's love for David had not changed. God's love was true. I heard one of the team members say this morning, I'm praising Jesus this morning that though many times I am faithless, Jesus Christ remains faithful. Lord, I didn't move. Or, I mean, you didn't move, but I did. Lord, have mercy upon me because though my love for you changed and I chose to love sin more than you, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast, unchanging love, according to your abundant mercy, God, blot out my transgressions. You know, once we get saved, Kibbit told me, y'all, he's been preaching through Romans, and we think about positional righteousness. Once you get saved, you are made a saint. In Christ, not because of your merit, but because of Christ's merit. He clothes you with a robe of righteousness. You're now positionally sanctified, legally blameless, set free by the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that incredible? 
I mean, I want you to think about this for a moment. When Jesus Christ saved you, he didn't just save you from the penalty of sin. He saved you from the power of sin that dominated your life. And one day, and it's coming soon, he's going to save you from the presence of sin forever. I mean, Jesus didn't just save me from hell. Jesus said, I'm going to do more than that. I'm going to wash you clean and I'm going to adopt you. Jesus didn't have to do that. Jesus said, oh, not only am I going to adopt you, I'm going to make you a joint heir with me. I mean, isn't that incredible? That before Christ, all you deserve is hell, and Jesus Christ absorbs every drop of wrath so that we can drink the cup of everlasting life forever, and then he gives us every blessing. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And by the way, there's nothing more God can give you than himself. He is the gift. Somebody better say amen. We're in North Carolina. I, if I, yeah, I won't go there, but I've been preaching all over the country, and there's parts of the country they've never heard the word amen. All right. You know what amen means? You're not saying amen to the preacher. You're saying, that is true. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be so. Amen. amen. If you're in Christ Jesus, you've been positionally made righteous. But you know what David's talking about here? He's talking about experiential righteousness. Though he had been saved, he had lost the joy of his salvation because he allowed sin to enter in. And now the intimacy that he had been saved for, the relationship he had been saved for, though he still belonged to God, though his salvation was secure, the intimacy had gone away. The fellowship had gone away. The closeness had gone away. Not because God moved, but because David moved. So what do you do in your life when that happens? You say, God, have mercy on me. I'm not going to bargain with you. As 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, I thought I wanted sin, but now all I want is you. I was wrong. You are right. You've always been right. Oh, God, restore to me the joy of our relationship. Notice what he says in verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. You know why David was a man after God's own heart? It's not because he never messed up. It's because of what he did when he came to grips with how he messed up. You know, this is totally opposite than what Adam and Eve did in the garden. You remember God came to them when they sinned, and he said, uh, hey guys, could y'all come over here for a minute? What y'all been doing? And uh, he looked at them and said, hey, did you eat of the tree that I told you not to? And you remember what Adam did? He did not do what we just read in verse 2 and 3. He said, the woman you gave me made me do it. Then he comes over to Eve and he said, hey, what, what have you been up to? Oh, wait a second, God. Uh, I, I'm not sorry. I'm not going to confess it. I'm not wrong. The serpent made me do it. In other words, Adam and Eve were not repentant. David is a man after God's own heart because right here in this psalm, he shows us what repentance looked like. And repentance says, God, if I am in a desert right now, it's my own fault. If I'm not intimate with you, though I'm securing my salvation, it's not your fault, it's not my wife's fault, it's not my husband's fault, it's not Pastor Kivett's fault, it's not my church's fault, it is one person's fault. It's my fault. Someone once put it this way, if you find yourself in a spiritual desert this morning, it's probably because you chose to be there. And David knew that. You know what I love about David right here? He shows us what true confession looks like. Confession is not only agreeing with God about where you are, but it's you taking all the blame. In fact, someone once put it this way, confession is the doorway to true healing. 
So this morning, if you don't feel like you and God are intimate, or there was a time where you were more intimate than you are now, there's only one way to get that back. It's confession. It's saying, oh God, search my heart, try my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me. God, as I'm in your word, where am I not like your word? God, is there known sin that I know is there, but I've not been willing to humble myself and get it right? And God, for many of us, it's this. We're so busy, we don't even remember the last time we sat down and said, God, is there anything wrong? You know, you know one of the scariest times in my Christian life is when I've got so busy doing stuff for God that I could go weeks and realize, you know what, I don't know when the last time is I confessed anything. Let me run something by you. If you've gone weeks and you haven't confessed any sin in weeks, there's only two possibilities. Either one, you've got sin that you're ignoring, but you've been so busy you hadn't stopped to spend time with God to let Him reveal that to you and get that right. Or number two, you've gone weeks without sinning. David says, God, what I thought looked so good on the afternoon has become my worst nightmare, and I want you back. For some of you sitting here this morning, it's not adultery. It's not murder. It's not some big egregious sin. It could simply be, you've been so busy. And this morning you're saying, God, if I stay this way and I start, and if I continue to neglect intimacy with you, I'm going to end up in a desert and then I may end up in something egregious. And it could be simply this morning you go before God and say, God, I'm tired of being tired. I'm tired of being so busy. I'm tired of being so distracted. I'm tired of being so anxious. God, it's not worth it. I want you back. I think of Romans 15, 13 this morning. Now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound and overflow in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's God's will for our life. Not this tired, strung out, burn out, can't remember the last time we were quiet before God. That's not what God saved us for. He saved us for intimacy. I want you to notice a few more things this morning. Notice he says in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, I was born with a sin nature. Praise God, Jesus saves in verse 6, behold, you delight truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. You know what David's saying? He's saying, God, I want the joy and freedom of a clear conscience back. Can I suggest this to you? There is nothing more freeing in your life than when if you go to bed tonight, and as you go to sleep, there's nothing between you and God, and there's nothing between you and someone else, because you got a clear conscience before God and man. David said, I want that freedom back. I want that sincerity back. God, I want you to know me from my head to my toe, and I want you to be okay with everything. I want you to be pleased with everything. I want to be right with you. So therefore, verse 7, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. God, let me hear joy and gladness. Fill me with all joy and peace again. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. In other words, God, I've been under your discipline. You've been disciplining me as a son, trying to bring me back. And finally, Lord, I, you got my attention, and I want you back. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out not just some of my iniquities. God, I want all my iniquities gone. Can I run something by you real quick? I'm, I'm amazed in the Bible how many passages use the word all or every. Listen real carefully. What would your life look like this morning if you were completely right with God in all areas? Like nothing hidden. Everything has been made right. Notice what he says here. God, don't just forgive me for the sin with Bathsheba and having her husband murdered. Lord, blot out all my iniquities. My grumbling, my complaining, my apathy, my critical spirit, my jealousy, my insecurity, my envy, me, my prayerlessness. Lord, I want it all gone because I want all of you. Notice what he says in verse 10. God created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. God, I want to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And God, that has not been the case for two years 
And Lord, I want you back and I want you filling me and I want you working through my life again. Therefore, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Now, we know as New Testament believers, the Holy Spirit cannot be taken from you. You've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the living God. That is incredible. Therefore, all who are in Christ Jesus should no longer live for themselves, but for Christ who died and rose again. We're all called to full-time Christian ministry because you're indwelt by a full-time Holy Spirit. That was an amen cue. Amen. Amen. How many of you are thankful that God lives in you this morning? So the Holy Spirit cannot be taken away from us, but you know what the New Testament does say? We can quench him and grieve him. You say, what is quenching the Spirit? Quenching is like if there's a candle burning and our God is a consuming fire and many times the Holy Spirit is representative of a fire, it's you walking up to the candle and going, psst. It's those times when you're in Walmart and the Holy Spirit impresses upon your heart. Hey, tell that person about me. And you're like, no, I'm busy. I got to get out of here. Psst. It's those times where you're sitting in the evening and all you want to do is crash and watch TV and the Holy Spirit puts on your heart. Hey, why don't you go to your bedroom and spend some time with me? And you're like, no, I'm too tired for that. Psst. And if you do that long enough, you start to dull get calloused and you stop hearing him speak by his word like you used to hear him but the bible says not only can you quench the spirit as a new testament believer you can grieve the spirit the word grieve in the original language literally means you can make the holy spirit grieve with deep emotional almost anguish and crying he's a person not an it And he's come to live inside you and me. And he wants us to be completely filled and controlled by him so that Christ goes on display through our life. It is never about us. It's always about Christ. And we are to be controlled by another. Lord, I want to be filled with your spirit again. And notice what he says. When this happens and the joy of his salvation in verse 12 is restored and he's upheld by a willing spirit with the spirit of God upon his life, notice what happens in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. You know what? I was looking back over that again this morning. That is just incredible. I'm almost done. I'll tell you why that's so incredible to me. I don't want to speak for Kibbit, but Kibbit and I grew up in a church where for a while it was like a mortuary with a steeple. Would you agree with that? We always were taught the Bible. We always heard the gospel. But I'm telling you, there were times it was dead, dead, dead. And I'm not even sure we knew it. And if the Holy Spirit showed up, we wouldn't recognize him. And as, a, and, and as a result of that, we went years at times without seeing anyone get saved. You know what David just said? He said, here's the key to seeing people get saved. Get right with God. That's what he just said. He said, God, when I'm right with you and I'm walking filled with you and I'm walking intimate with you, here's the first thing that's going to happen. As you fill me, I'm going to get on mission with you. Your heart's going to be my passion and you're going to start working through me. And the next thing you know, people are going to start coming to you and sinners are going to be converted and people are going to learn about you. Why? Because you use people. I was reading this verse a few weeks ago and I was thinking, as much as we need to get money to the mission field, As much as we need to send new missionaries to the mission field, let me tell you what we need more than money and people. We need right hearts. I know that your church has a vision to reach 1% of the people in Winston-Salem. That's incredible. You say, man, that sounds like an impossible task. Well, the God of impossible never calls us to something we can do. He always calls us to something that only he can do through us. You say, man, when are we going to see that happen? I'll tell you the first step. When all of us are walking in intimacy with him, we are filled with his spirit. There's nothing wrong between him and us. There's nothing wrong between us and others. That's when he'll use us. And next thing you know, people start getting saved left and right. It's about the condition of the vessels. 
But yet in this country, 1,500 to 4,000 churches a year shut their doors. You say, why is that? There could be a lot of factors, but I'll tell you this. I've yet to see a group of people that were alive with Christ that had to shut their doors. Because when something's alive, it's alive. And when something's dead, it's dead. I close with this. Verse 14, deliver me from the blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. And and God, when I get right with you, let me tell you what's going to happen, and it's so not Baptist. (laughs) By the way, I was a Baptist before I was born again, so just letting you know, I'm all for Baptist. Lord, when I get right with you and I get that joy back, watch out. My tongue will sing quietly like I'm at a funeral of your righteousness. Is that what it says? It says, no, no, no. My tongue will sing aloud of your salvation. (laughs) You know what? We travel in churches all around the country. And there's sometimes I just want to get up after we get done singing and go, hey, folks, got some news for you. Jesus actually rose again. We are not at a funeral this morning. We worship a risen Christ who is seated seated at the right hand of the Father, who right now ever lives to make intercession for us. And in him we have every victory. In him we have all things. And though we may be earthly poor, in him we are rich beyond measure. Sing aloud of his praises. Because Christians not only have something to sing about, we've got the only thing to sing about. Sometimes I wonder, in some of the Baptist churches I've grown up in, you know, we we look around and we go, man, our teenagers don't want to come to church anymore. Our our children don't want to come to church anymore. I can tell you one of the reasons why, just watching the congregation when you sing. If I was singing, uh, if I was singing words like we sung this morning, that there's this person who is everything, who's changed my life, but I'm singing like it's done nothing for me, and then my teenager is looking over at me going, you know what, dad doesn't seem too excited about that, and this seems pretty boring, I think I'll go find something else to do. You know what David said? He said, one of the first signs that I've got my intimacy back with God is two things. God's going to use me to reach people. And number two, I'm not going to be able to be quiet and I'm going to sing aloud of his glorious praises. We were in a church not long ago and I got to be careful what I say because people follow us online and I don't want to offend any churches, but this was a very quiet church team would sing we had our services team would kind of get excited and testify and like nothing i mean it's just cold well after several days a young lady who used to travel on our team years ago came and visited us at that church and she was sitting back in the on the far left and team sang their very first song (laughs) i know i forget she stood up and go and said hallelujah and i'm i'm sitting on the front row going yep hallelujah I I felt the whole church just go. But when I read that verse, I got a question for you. Who was right and who was wrong? David just said, I'll sing aloud of your salvation. The joy that comes to the house of God when they get the joy of their salvation Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Pastor's going to come and close us as he sees fit. I don't know how God has spoken to your heart this morning. But may, over these next few days, if we are lacking any joy in our intimacy with Jesus, that by God's grace, we get it back. Pastor.